Welcome to another session of analytical techniques or electrochemistry. Today we look into potentiometric titration. Before we move on, subscribe for more informative videos. Share the video. If you like the video, tap the like button. At the end of the session, you will be able to state the principle of potentiometric titration, enumerate the types of potentiometric titration and various electrodes used for the same. Explain the procedure and various methods of determining the equivalence point and you will also be able to list out the advantages, disadvantages and applications of this technique. First, let us understand what is potentiometric titration. That is, it is the titration used to measure the amount of an analyte present in the given solution by measuring the change in the potential by a suitable indicator electrode as a function of volume of titrant. That is, as the titration proceeds, there will be a change in the potential which is indicated by the indicator electrode as the amount of the analyte solution changes. That is, as the concentration of the analyte solution changes, there will be a change in the potential which is indicated by the indicator electrode. We have different types of potentiometric titration. Firstly, it was restricted to redox reactions. Now it is extended for acid base, complexometric and also precipitation titrations. We we'll look into the major requirements of potentiometric titration. We actually require an electrochemical cell. So we require an electrolyte and two electrodes. One is the reference electrode, which is also called as a counter electrode. So it will also always show the constant potential or EMF. We can use AG, AGCL electrode or calomel electrode. Indicator electrode which is also called as a working electrode which is the most important part of this potentiometric titration. It responds to the change in the concentration of the analyte solution. So the electrolyte will contain the analyte solution. In some cases especially when you use glass electrode you can go for combination electrode. Instead of reference and indicator electrode being separately used both can be combined. There are different types of indicator electrode. This is a major portion of potentiometric titration. So we need to understand the different types of indicator electrode. First type is the inert electrode, which is majorly used for redox reaction. When this is dipped in the analyte solution, we see that it indicates the potential of the bulk solution. It's very important. Whatever you have in the analyte solution, all will be indicated in the that is, the potential will be responding for the whole bulk solution when we use the inert electrode. And there are two types. It can be a metallic electrode like platinum, gold or silver or it can be other conductive electrodes like graphite or glassy carbon. It obeys Nernst equation. I am just showing the half cell part that is only the indicator electrode part. E0 represents the a standard reduction potential of that particular system. And R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, F is the Faraday's constant and N is the number of electrons involved in the reaction, that is it's a redox reaction. And this is natural logarithm, activity of the reduced species by the activity of the oxidized species. In case we use the dilute solution, the activities can be changed to the concentration of reduced species to concentration of oxidized species. Here I have just shown a platinum electrode. Next part is the ion selective electrode which is very important for potentiometric titration. This responds to the change in the activity or the concentration of a particular species in the analyte solution. It's unlike your inert electrode. This will respond to a particular species. So they do not respond to all the species present in the solution. It's very important because for example water contains calcium, magnesium, potassium, fluoride etc. But I want to determine only the fluoride ions. So I select a suitable ion selective electrode so that only fluoride ion is determined because this electrode will respond only to fluoride ions. So it's a very important type of electrode. For this again the Nernst equation similar to that constant here depends on the ion selective electrode. All the other terms remain same. Z is the charge on the ion and AI is the activity of the ion. Yeah, again, if we use the dilute solution instead of activity, we can go for the concentration of the ion. 
So these are the various types of ion selective electrodes. Commonly used uh, electrode for pH determination, acid based titration, we use glass electrode. Other electrodes are liquid ion exchange electrodes, solid state ion electrodes, coated wire electrodes, field effect transistor electrodes, neutral carrier ion selective electrodes that is for complexometric titration we use, gas sensing electrodes especially when you want to monitor dissolved gases, biomembrane electrodes within the membrane you will have enzyme which acts as the catalyst. So we need a separate session to discuss about the ion selective electrodes. I am just listing out few in order to to understand what are the different types of electrodes used for potentiometric titrations. And uh, because we have seen the different types of potentiometric titration, we will see what electrodes are commonly used. For redox reaction, we can use metallic electrodes. For acid base, as I have already said, glass electrode or combined glass and reference electrode. For complexometric, we can go for metallic as well as ion selective. And for precipitation, similarly, we can go for metallic or ion selective electrodes. Now we will understand the procedure by going into a special case that is redox reaction which, because it is very commonly used. We are going to determine the amount of ferrous ions. So we can take ferrous ammonium sulfate or ferrous sulfate as the analyte solution and the titrant we require an oxidizing agent. So we take potassium dichromate or we can also use potassium permanganate. So the titrant is filled in the burette. And in the analyte, we take FAS that is ferrous ammonium sulfate or ferrous sulfate along with sulfuric acid because potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent in acidic medium. Now we require the two electrodes, the reference electrode, we can normally take saturated calomel electrode which acts as a reference electrode and the metallic electrode, I am taking platinum here which acts as the indicator electrode. And during the reaction, that is titration, the solution has to be stirred continuously. So we use a magnetic pellet here and we can adjust the stirring rate using this knob. And the stirring is maintained such that it does not break the electrode. A small swirl should form when you are stirring it and you can maintain the stirring that way. This can also be done with an automated potentiometric titrator where we need not manually titrate it. It automatically does and gives us the equivalence point. Now we look into the procedure. That is before we add any titrant, we note down the EMF value. Here it is in millivolts. We are noting down 374 millivolts and as the titration progresses we add incremental addition of potassium dichromate that is 1 ml here I am taking 1 ml you can also go for 0.5 ml and it can also be ununiform change that is I can add 1 ml 0.5 ml 2 ml 2.5 ml etc we are, nothing is going to make a big difference because we are going to determine the end point or the equivalence point using the graph. So as we add the potassium dichromate, it's an oxidizing agent. As the titration proceeds, what happens is in the beginning before the potassium dichromate is added, uh, here we have only ferrous ions. As the potassium dichromate is added, the ferrous ions gets oxidized to ferric ions and potassium dichromate gets uh, reduced. So you can see that dichromate gets reduced and ferrous ions gets oxidized. So as the titration pro uh, proceeds, the relative increase in uh, Fe3 plus occurs and Fe2 plus decreases. That is the concentration of Fe3 plus keeps increasing and the concentration of Fe2 plus keeps decreasing. So in the uh, beaker will have both Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus solution. So we see that as we keep adding slowly there will be a change in the uh, EMF value here and we need to note down that is a very slow change that is 374 can go as 380, 385, 390 some 5 to 10 millivolts alone will increase but at a particular addition we see that there will be a drastic change of more than 100 to 200 millivolts 
so that is our equivalence point where all the ferrous ions are getting converted to ferric ions or all the ferrous ions are getting oxidized to ferric ions and you will notice a drastic change you can see that the color of the solution has changed and the potential value is 679 here so this obeys the nernst equation first i showed you only the half cell here we are taking the full cell that is this is the reference electrode standard potential here i am taking uh, standard ca saturated calomel electrode so 0.2422 and this is for your ferrous ferric system ferrous ferric ion system you see that e not is the standard reduction potential of the system which is 0.77 volts and for calomel 0.2422 volts and r T, N, F, all this remains constant. We see that the EMF, that is what is shown in the display, mainly depends on only this term. That is natural logarithm of Fe2 plus concentration to Fe3 plus concentration ratio. So, as this concentration continuously changes during the titration, this long term will change and the EMF changes this is what you are seeing in the display now we'll see how to tabulate our readings first we take the volume of the titrant here volume of potassium dichromate 0 1 i have taken uniform change in the volume and 1 1 ml 1 2 3 4 etc next we are noting down the emf what you are seeing in the display you see that in the beginning we, there is a very incremental change at a particular addition it has moved from 423 to 679 so we have almost reached the equivalence point at this point you should be very careful you should add very slowly that is after this you should wait for two to three minutes so that the reading does not fluctuate and you get a stable reading so you need to wait otherwise you will be splitting the end point into two readings okay we should get a single peak single increase and after this you again see that there is no much change in the emf value potential value remains same this is the first titration actually if you want even more accurate reading we should again repeat the potentiometric titration between 7.5 we have determined where the end point is so we are repeating the titration from 8 to 9 instead of 8 to 9 we go little before from 7.5 ml we start adding 1.1.1 ml that is 7.5 7.6 7.8 so that we get an accurate endpoint because in that one drop of addition only we are going to get the endpoint we have to determine that particular point so we should repeat the titration again so that we get a new plot and next is the, uh, we can directly plot EMF on the y-axis and volume of the titrant on the x-axis and get a curve. But here the endpoint may not be that accurate. So we can go for the first derivative curve and second derivative curve also. For the first derivative curve, we are going to take the difference of the consecutive readings. That is second reading minus first reading, third reading minus second reading. You see that difference is 666 six, six. and at this particular drastic change you see that there is a drastic difference in the delta E value very huge reading we get again delta V because we are uniformly adding the potassium dichromate solution it is 1 1 ml so this delta E by delta V this divided by this does not give much difference because this is 1 but if this varies this will also vary for this is your first derivative curve this will be on the y axis and volume will be on the x axis and we can get the first derivative curve for the second derivative curve the difference in this reading itself second minus first third minus second so delta of delta e by delta v and we get two peak values one in the positive quadrant one in the negative quadrant divided by delta v again so that we get delta square e by delta v square here because your delta v is 1 we don't get any change in these two columns actually if there is change in delta v 
there will be a change in this column value also. So for the second derivative curve, we plot this on the y-axis and volume on the x-axis. So you see that redox titration curve, it, we get an S curve. It can be an inverted S also depending on the uh, titrant and the analyte solution. The midpoint of this straight line or where there is an inflection or where the point at which the slope is maximum is the end point or the equivalence point. We are not supposed to use the word end point. End point is used when you are doing volumetric titration where there is a color change which is slightly greater than our equivalence point. So this is our equivalence point. This may not be that accurate because I may take this point and other person may take slightly uh, above this and one can take slightly lower than this. And here we are seeing that this 8 to 9 we are having a drastic change. So that will be our equivalence point. So instead of going to this, in order to get a sharp and accurate reading, we can go for the first derivative or second derivative curve. Now you see that only one peak point is there. And when you draw the curve, delta E by delta V versus volume, and you get a sharp end point, single point, you can drop the line down perpendicularly. And this is our equivalence point. In the second derivative curve, one in the positive quadrant, one in the negative quadrant and this point is the equivalence point. So we take delta square E by delta V square is plotted in the y axis. So the second derivative and first derivative gives us a sharp indication. Once the end point is arrived, like any other volumetric titration, you can determine by knowing the equivalence weight of the uh, analyte solution. That is whatever we are taking. If I want to determine ferrous ions, I should take the equivalent weight and you can do that ordinary volumetric titration uh, calculation to get the amount of ferrous ions present in the analyte solution. In case uh, we go for acid-base titration, the reference electrode will be calomel or AG, AGCl. Indicator electrode will be glass or we can go for the combined electrode. Analyte solution, if it is acid, titrant will be base and vice versa. Here, instead of measuring the EMF, we can directly measure the pH. We can also use a pH meter instead of a potentiometric titration. pH versus volume, delta pH versus uh, delta V versus volume and delta square pH versus delta V square versus volume. That is first derivative curve and second derivative curve. This way, you will go for acid-based titration. We have a lot of advantages with this potentiometric titration. That is, we, it is used for colored solution, turbid solution, fluorescent solutions, dilute solutions. Very small quantities of the sample is enough. Special care is not required at the end point. We get a sharp and accurate end point, especially with the first and second derivative curve. And everything is determined graphically and it does not require any indicator. And we do have some drawbacks. Accurate known concentration of solution is required. My analyte and titrant, I should prepare with accurate concentration. Otherwise, my endpoint or equivalence point will be wrong. And it's labor intensive. I said two titrations you should do because in order to get a very accurate reading and it's time consuming. And it is highly sensitive to pH. So a slight change in pH may give a drastic change, especially if you're going for acid-based titrations. And we look into few applications, clinical chemistry, analysis of metals, pollutants in water, such as metals, cyanide, fluorides, ammonia can be measured, agriculture, various elements in soil, fertilizers, you can also use in food processing industry, detergent manufacturing industries and other industries such as cosmetic, textile, paper, paint, explosive, energy, etc. So this is not the end of applications. It can be used in any industries. It's a very versatile method. This is all for the session. Let us meet with another topic in another session. Until then, bye-bye. Don't forget to subscribe for more such informative videos. Please drop in your comments and tap the like button if you like the video. Thank you.